let's have a look at the bon under the bonnet with the famous detachable golf for the bonnet pull. Hello guys and welcome to this Volks Wizard video. Now in stark contrast to last week's video where I gave you my experience of owning and then buying and selling Mark 7 Golf R's, today thankfully we're going to do something a little bit more positive and talk about what I think is one of Volkswagen's most reliable engines ever and how I bought a car thus equipped for just a pound. But before we do that, I want to say big thanks for all the views and comments over the last couple of weeks. It's really much appreciated. Sorry I haven't been able to reply to them all. As ever, if you haven't subscribed yet and you enjoy this kind of content, then please do so because every subscription means a lot right now. It's basically make or break at the moment. Anyway, without any further ado, let's talk about Volkswagen's TDI PD diesel. Okay, to fully appreciate the TDI PD diesel engine, you need to look at what came before it. Now, the diesels of the 80s were pretty terrible, lumbering things, very slow, very noisy. And that reputation stuck with diesel cars, even though the technology progressed rapidly. So by the end of the 80s, we had turbochargers, we had intercoolers, and those cars were really good. But people, particularly in the UK, didn't buy them. In France, it was a different story. The majority of cars over there were diesel, not least because the cost at the pumps was significantly less. But here, it was a very niche concern, a bit like cutting your own hair, or schooling your own children, or brewing your own beer. Nobody really did it. Nobody in polite company did it. Now things got a lot better in 94 because Volkswagen brought out the Mark III Golf TDI. And this differed from what came before it in that, well, it still had turbos and intercoolers, but now it had direct injection, which pumped fuel straight into the cylinder, which made it more efficient, faster, or better economy, or both really. It was an incredible car. It went on into the A4, the A6, lots of other cars, Chiran. You had 90 horsepower or 110 horsepower, which was a great car. Now, when the Mark IV Golf came out, that engine continued for a couple of years, but in 1999, it was updated to the PD. So it was still called TDI, still had direct injection. The big difference was, instead of having a big, expensive fuel pump bolted to the front of the engine that served all four cylinders, each cylinder had its own pump and injector combined into one. They're called unit injectors. And that meant you could go even higher with the injector pressures and have even more economy and even more performance. And those cars they really transformed diesel. Strangely enough, no other manufacturer changed. They continued with the common rail system, which actually Volkswagen went back to in 2008 because of emissions reasons. But in the early noughties, emissions weren't such a big deal when it came to diesels. The CO2 levels were really low on these cars. But when you start talking about particulates, PDs weren't very good. And that's why they were problematic when coupled with a diesel particulate filter, which was a requirement for some cars anyway from about 2006. And those cars gave DPF a bit of a bad name, even though when the later common rail diesels used DPF, they were quite reliable. So yeah, it's an incredible engine. You could have it in 90 horsepower. You could have it in 100, 115, 130, 150 even in the Golf. A Golf GTI even had this diesel engine and it wasn't particularly terrible to drive. I mean, the 2.0-litre GTI and even the 150, 1.8T were probably not as nice to drive as the 150 diesel. You could even have it in three-cylinder, which made it into the Polo and the Audi A2 as a 75 horsepower and 90 horsepower versions, but they were particularly unrefined. There was something about that three-cylinder configuration that made them sound like you had a Duracell bunny tapping away in your head. Duracell batteries can make fun times last a lot longer. So I think it's now a good time to give you a tour of this car and see what your pound actually buys you. Okay, before we have a look around this amazing car, let me just tell you a bit about it. I originally sold it in 2008 and kept in touch with the owner. Sorry about the wind, by the way. And therefore I know exactly what he spent on it. And it's peanuts. It's original engine, turbo, clutch, gearbox. He really hasn't spent anything other than maybe the odd shock absorber on it. But the reason I bought it for a pound was because it's nearly broke down. It uh, started to misfire. He lives in London. He was up here on business. He limped it here and I diagnosed an injector failure. Now, because of the mileage it's done, I hope you're sitting down for this, 217,000 miles, as I said, without pretty much anything being spent on it. There must be higher mileage cars, but I bet they've had more spent on it than this one. 
he, um, I said, at that mileage, you, you never know when two, three and four injectors are going to go. And at £300 each, you're looking at £1,200 to replace all four if you want total peace of mind. He drives it abroad a lot because he's into cycling, so he goes to Belgium. So really, you know, when you're that far away from home, you need to have peace of mind in the car. So with the cam belt due and a few other bits, he said, just have it. So I paid a pound for it. And here it is today. Obviously, it's not really worth a pound unless you can get it running. And luckily, because they're so old, parts are actually quite available. So whilst I'd never fit secondhand parts to a customer's car because they could go wrong the minute they start to drive down the road, they wouldn't be very happy. I'd have to do the job again for free and I'd look really stupid just trying to save them money. But because it's my own car, I just got onto eBay and I bought four injectors. Now, like I said, brand new, you're looking at £1,200. Guess how much four were? <laughs> nope, lower, lower, £55 for four. So let me just show you what they look like because I've got some spares, you see. So this is your PD injector. Not really much to look at, is it? But it's driven by the cam load there, squeezes the fuel in down there. And, yeah, that's it. So I've got some spares if I wanted to take it abroad. I did actually fancy taking it to Wolfsburg just for the crack because it's a Wolfsburg built car. I thought it'd be great to take it back, but I think with coronavirus that's not going to happen this year, so that's probably not something I'm ever going to get around to. Right, let me just show you what we've got then. So it's silver, it's quite a late car. You can get Mark V hatches from 53 Reg. The Golf Estate carried on running, I think, till about 2006. And this is a 2006 model year car. The Golf Estate 5 started in 2008, so there was a bit of a gap which they filled by making this one for all that time. Uh, it's lived in London, so it's got a few battle scars here and there, but it's a pretty solid car. I don't think he's ever had any paintwork done. He probably ought to have had it done. It's been keyed by someone who's obviously very jealous of it. So there we have it. It's with a good clean, it should look pretty good. It's been here since February and I haven't washed it. It's just stood around, so it does look a bit sorry for itself. But with a bit of touching in, a bit of polishing, I reckon it would look all right. Basically, the car itself has done well. It's just the abuse from the owners and other people that have brought it down, unfortunately. But that's goals for you. Inside, it's done a bit better, I think. So 217,000 miles, we've just got a bit of wear there. How many hours of your life do you have to spend sitting in that chair to do 217,000 miles? Don't even want to think about it. The steering wheel is leather, being an SE, and it's still pretty pleasant. It's a bit shiny, but you wouldn't really be too concerned about that. Gear knob's got a bit of wear. Handbrake pull, mint. All these switches still feel lovely. Golf 4 was a funny car because it had a perception of quality to it. All this looks very Audi-esque, but it had loads of little niggles like math sensors and coolant temperature sensors, window regulators, air conditioning, as was a problem on this car. So, yeah, look at that. I mean, it is mint. Even the pedals are like new. Got a bit of an issue with the water leak. That's why we've got mushrooms growing in the footwell. But I think that's because the metal plate behind here, the window regulator's bolted to, has got a seal around it, a gasket. And after 15 years, that just erodes and water comes into the car. I've actually seen water running down here into the footwell. So that's a, quite an easy fix. But just look at that mileage. It's also got the big screen display, which people used to get quite excited about. Okay, there's a bit of dirt on the roof lining, but you can't blame the car for that. That's from his bike. It's got the front centre armrest as well, which people got very excited about back in the day. And it works, even that often broken bit is mint. Let's have a look at the bon under the bonnet with the famous detachable Golf 4 bonnet pull. Very common. It's amazing how much they got wrong on these cars, actually. So we've got some big chips and stuff, but actually a good clean and polished wouldn't be too bad. So there we have it, a four-cylinder TDI PD diesel engine. This is the 100 horsepower version, and it's good for 0 to 60 in about 12 seconds, which is a couple of seconds slower than the 130. 
Uh, torque is a bit lower as well, but it still feels brightly on the road, as we'll find out shortly. Now, there should be an under tray on this car to keep the noise within the engine bay, but that's gone. A very common thing on Golf 4s, particularly urban ones with speed humps, is that they tend to rip the under trays off, so we took that off quite a long time ago, and that's why there's a bit of corrosion here and there, but it still works. Lovely. So, as I mentioned earlier, the air conditioning stopped working because the pipe, you probably can't see, but it does kind of pop out here, an aluminium pipe, was leaking somewhere. And I broke a Skoda, for, well actually I sent a Skoda to the scrapyard that I took in part X, but before it went, I knew this had gone. So I took the aircon pipe off it, it's been on the shelf for, I don't know, three years, four years, and I never really thought I'd get time to fit it to this because it's quite a big job. But because I had no time limit this time and because I was doing the cam belt anyway, I fitted it so it just needs regassing. So we might even have working aircon, which would be great. So anyway, that's enough about this car. Time now to go for a drive. Okay guys, here we are behind the wheel of the Mark IV Golf TDI PD100 Estate with a massive 217,432 miles on its digital odometer and you'd be forgiven for thinking that it would drive like a bag of nails but it doesn't okay it's not perfect the clutch is a little bit heavier than it was originally but amazingly the biting point is where it should be it's very easy to drive the shock absorbers which i think are largely original on this car are a bit tired they were never that brilliant when they were new but now they're a little bit floaty and a bit under damp but perfectly acceptable you can still drive it quite happily and it doesn't bang or rattle as well which is important uh, also important are the brakes i think by the time Volkswagen got to the mark IV, the braking systems were pretty much perfect and thanks to regular brake disc and pad changes this car still feels pretty good i'm not sure it's had fluid changes but yeah it still feels utterly safe and composed under braking steering well again steering wears out on older cars you'd go through uh, track rod ends and so on sometimes even racks this car's original and feels just like a mark 4 did it's not the sharpest tool in the box but there's no slack in there it's it's incredible really but the overriding impression is the strength of the engine now, shock absorbers, steering, brakes, they all have a bit of time off when you're driving, but the engine is constantly churning away. And this one feels so fit and healthy, it's unbelievable. It's the original engine, original turbo. It's even quite smooth, which I think is probably a benefit of being a lower power PD engine. So it hasn't been worked as hard throughout its life. I've, I drive daily a uh, TDI 150, of the modern common rail version and it feels strangulated compared to this i mean this is fourth gear now we're doing let's drop to third say because it's a 30 mile an hour zone it's about 2000 rpm now put my foot down and it just goes into fourth and again there's massive surge of torque well relatively massive it's got 240 newton meters of torque which is about 20% 20, 20 down on the TDI PD130. But if you've ever driven a TDI PD130, you know that car likes to shift. And that was the beauty of these engines. The equivalent to this 100 horsepower was, I think, a 1.6 16 valve. The clue is in the name. 16 valve engines need to be worked. And the people who bought these cars, they weren't the kind of people who liked to rev an engine. That engine went in the Lupo GTI, where it made a lot more sense. But the people who drive these want mid-range performance they want torque and in the real world these cars were incredible i wished i'd been working in a volkswagen dealership i don't say that very often but when these came out when you were trying to sell them and people went on a test drive and they felt that surge like that or more in the higher power versions deal done and at that point they didn't even know how reliable they'd, they'd be it's an incredible piece of kit this it's a bit sad as well though because emissions regulations have made these cars a lot more complicated and a lot less reliable and that's that's a real shame and they're not even more 
economical. I'm pretty sure this car will do more than my brand new, now run-in, Leon. More miles to the gallon. It's already done 47 on sort of test driving, which generally means it will do a lot more on a steady run. So is that really progress? We have cars that are a lot more unreliable and barely any more economical. I don't know. Anyway guys, I hope you've enjoyed this Volks Wizard video. If you have, please give it a thumbs up. As I said earlier, please, please do subscribe. It really does mean a lot. And I'll see you for the next one really soon.